morning, everybody. If you will make your way to your seats, if everybody in the foyer can find them a place, uh, I want to share a word with you before we get started, and uh, um, we're going to have baptism in just a moment, and uh, I want you to hear what I'm about to say, okay, because it's, uh, it's important and it's, it's historic um, for the life of our church. So about a month ago, I had a situation where uh, a child and her parent came to me <clears throat> and asked me a question I have never been asked before. That question was, Pastor, we're, I'm ready to be baptized. I've given my life to Christ. I want to get baptized. But I want to ask if it's okay if Miss Kaylee Presley baptizes me. And I went, <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> so I asked them if they'd just give me a day or two to think about it and to, to figure it all out. Here was my pause. Here, this was the reason for the pause. <clears throat> Historically, you know, and, and biblically, we know that the, the pastor role is reserved for a man, Okay. And because it's that way, most baptisms occur in churches and pastors do the baptism. But I began to look in Scripture and see what the Bible says about it. Now, most of the time in Scripture, the person who's doing the baptism is not named. When Jesus was baptized, we know John the Baptist did it, right? The Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts, he was baptized by uh, Philip, the evangelist. I was reading today about Paul. Paul got saved, and he was being discipled by Ananias and Sapphira, his wife. No, not Sapphira. Um, that, that's the wrong one. Um, uh, no. No, totally, totally wrong. Aquila and Priscilla. There we go. I, I was reading a lot of names. Aquila and Priscilla discipled Paul. And it says about Paul that Paul was baptized, but it doesn't say who baptized him. In Titus, the Bible says that the younger women should be taught by the older women. They ought to be taught how to be the proper homemakers, how to love their husbands, how to live the Christian life from a female perspective. In other words, the proper way for Women to grow in, in their walk primarily is under their husband's spiritual leadership and under another mentor or mentors another woman. In the same way, men, the older men are to teach the younger men how to be Christians. Go look it up in Titus, what the Bible says about that. That's one of the reasons why I don't counsel women alone. It, nowhere in Scripture to tell me that that's part of my role. Now, we will counsel women, but you either have to bring your husband or my wife will be there and so forth and so on. So this whole concept here is something I, I, I began to look at and I began to talk to other people about and began to look into this whole process and see, what is this? And what does the Bible say? And you know, in Matthew 28, it says, go and make disciples. And then it says this, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The church is to be about the business of making disciples. And when you make disciples, you baptize them. You mark them. It's the church's responsibility to baptize. It's no one person's responsibility, right? And that's why over the years we've allowed dads and other people uh, to baptize their children and so forth and so on. So in, these ca in this case, these two young ladies want their mentor, Kaylee Presley, to baptize them. And I find that to be exhilarating and to be supported by Scripture and because Scripture's silent, basically, on rules for baptism. 
You know what else? The Bible never tells me as a pastor that I'm to marry anybody. So don't call me no more. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. So obviously there are roles that, that the Scripture doesn't speak to. So, so we've decided this is a good thing. And Brother Jacob's going to be in there also. These are the children's leaders on Wednesday night. And they have impacted these children in a mighty way. Aren't you grateful that they have? Amen. <clears throat> so, we're going to have a disciple baptizing a new disciple. So, come on in here, Kaylee and Jacob. And Kaylee wants to say something. And we're going to have baptism. Okay? Awesome. Good morning. Good morning. Um, if anybody knows me, they know that I'm very transparent, so I wanted to just come up here and kind of give my two cents after Corey spoke. He basically said everything that I was thinking, um, but when Gracie and Maya came up to me and asked me to baptize them, about seven billion thoughts came into my head, and they've kind of boiled down into two points, just really quick. Um, the first point being that I want today to be not about the baptizer, but about the baptized. If you're saved and you have Jesus in your heart, you can be up here and baptizing people. And then my second point is, um, wow, am I worthy to do this? Um, that was a big one. And I just really had to lean into the fact that anybody is worthy, um, Jesus said, to go and do. And so I would love to be that example, not just to these girls, but to all of the kids that I get to love on every week. Um, that being said, I'm going to go ahead and ask Gracie to please come down here and we'll get things started. Okay. Gracie Wilson, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> She's been back here bouncing like a jelly bean. <laughs> All right, cross your arms. Are you going to plug your nose? Okay. Maya Valdez, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Was that not one of the most precious things you've ever seen? Isn't that beautiful? So thank you, church. And uh, this is the kind of stuff that's going on in our ministries throughout the week, and um, as Brother Cameron preached such an amazing message last week. How many of you were here last week, you heard Brother Cameron's message? What a message, right? I listened, I watched it while driving, and listened to, sorry. Um, at this, as we get ready to take up the offering, I want to remind you that at the end of the service, we're going to take up a second special offering for um, hurricane relief, and I'll tell you more about that at the very end. Brother Cameron talked about it last week, and um, and we're going to uh, we're going to proceed in that direction. Obviously, you can give um, if you you know if you don't if you're not prepared to give here, you can give online. You can just go to our website, um, JonesvilleBaptist.com, and you can click there. Or you, if you're on Realm, you can go there. Uh, do we even still have our app? Is that still active? Okay, okay, because I was so used to saying that over the years, uh, just go to the app and click give, so there, it's easy for you to give, and we'll tell you more about that, and you can do that and set up a regular giving for, for you know, your regular uh, church uh, offering, so, but before we take up the offering, I want us to be in prayer for Terry Riley's dad, uh, Terry uh, just got back from uh, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, you were there, what, two weeks, Terry? Four. You've been gone that long? So her dad has had major heart surgery, and uh, so she's exhausted and tired, and uh, prayerfully she'll be able to go back up and see her dad soon. But let's pray for him. Miss Ray McMartin will be having surgery this week, so let's pray for her. We have a praise report. We have Jen 
Carter, who came back last week, though I wasn't here. She had major surgery, and uh, she's on her way to recovery. So, Jen, good to see you. And uh, your seat was empty there, and uh, good to have you back, okay? So we need to remember all of these in prayer. And uh, let's go to Lord in prayer at this time. Father, we thank you for your mercies that are new every day. Thank you that um, hmm, we're never alone and that nothing happens to Christians that you don't know about. So I pray for these that we've mentioned. I pray for Terry's dad, that you would continue to be with him, help him to, to overcome this fluid buildup and all these complications that come sometimes with these procedures. Um, we pray for health for him and uh, for his caregivers, his family. I pray for Lorraine as she gets ready to have her surgery and that uh, you would be with her and Bruce as uh, he helps her recover. Thank you for Jen and uh, the successful surgery she has had, and uh, we look forward to healing that would come to her. We ask your blessings upon this offering that we can continue to serve you in our community, and I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, and you may be seated. Now, <clears throat> first of all, let me say this. Normally, every fall, I mean, you know, there's no guarantees in life, but every fall, I know what Sunday I'm usually going to miss. And it's the Sunday before Thanksgiving. It's kind of written, written down, uh, and um, it's, it's the one I'm, I usually decide to, uh, to take. Wasn't planning to take last Sunday off until about uh, six weeks ago when a, uh, an opportunity came my way and an offer um, was made to come speak on a Friday night to a group of men that have been gathering for nearly 50 years uh, o- over the years. You know, obviously men have come and gone and, and uh, there's a new generation of guys that are kind of uh, keeping this uh, tradition they have on West Forms alive. So, the West Forms is uh, my son-in-law's family, and um, his great uncle, I call him Uncle Bobby West, asked me if I would come to their big game supper that they have um, on that Friday night, and, you know, and I told him I would, and then I started looking at the calendar, calendar and I told Penny, I said, well, you know, um, we'll, just, we'll just go real quick, and then we'll come back on Saturday, and she goes, she goes, no. She said, I think we need to spend time with our daughter and our son-in-law and our family. And I said, well, you do that. I'm going to drive back. And she goes, no. No. I said, babe, I'm missing a a Sunday later on. She goes, tough. And um, you've been been in this for 36 years. um, And the church will survive without you. I said, oh, I know that. I know that. Uh, We've got some great people. But. So God gave me the opportunity to go there, and like the author of Church, uh, Third John, Third John, John the Apostle, older in life, and he goes, "I get, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are prospering in in truth and growing in truth, and I have no greater joy as a pastor than to hear that we had a great Sunday when I'm gone." Um, Coach Pritchett taught my class. And uh, from what I understand, we had more people there than today. And that's awesome. Really, it is. And, um, and I listened to the message, and I thought to myself, thank God I didn't preach because there, I couldn't come close to what that message was all about last Sunday. That was a great message, right, by our youth pastor. So um, I'm so grateful, you know, for those things. But God gave me an opportunity to speak to these men and, uh, and, and, and after it was over, it, it, it became clear to me why we needed to be there. Obviously, we had some wonderful family time while we were there. But God gave me a glimpse. You see, I'm kind of in a bubble here sometimes. And though I, I get out into the community, you know, it's easy for all of us to stay in our little world. And I see what God's doing in the lives of our men and women. I see new people coming into our church. I see, but more than just people coming in, I see those people getting, getting plugged in and getting excited about their walk with the Lord. I mean, we got men that come. They listen to me on Sunday. Then they come on Wednesday night. They come up for fellowship. And then I teach for an hour and 15 minutes. And they don't leave. 
And it's not because I'm a great teacher. It's because they love Jesus. They're growing. They want to eat this up. They want the Bible. They want, they want to be around other men of like-mindedness. And they have a passion for what's going on in their lives. And so what I'm seeing happening here in, in our community, in our, in our area, it, it's two things can be true at the same time, as I told our Sunday school class this morning. There are people right now that are moving toward God like I've never seen before. It's starting to happen. And not only are moving toward God, they're moving deeper. They're growing in discipleship. They want to know more about the Lord, and they want to grow, and they want these spiritual principles to apply to their life, and they don't want to live like they used to live. And yet, there are people in their own household, around their families, their friends, that are going away from God all at the same time. And I got to speak to those men, and I found out that night that there are men all over this country. It's a revival, a spiritual awakening that's happening with young men, middle-aged men, and older men. And the older men, we had two 90-plus-year-old guys there the other night, and man, they were sharp as a tack, and they were They were on it, on fire for God, not just living in their past glory, but living in what God is doing in their life right now. I got to talk to them for a long time, guys that I've met for the first time, and then a bunch of young men, and yes, we gathered around eating together, and uh, we talked stories about hunting, and people brought all their dead deer and put them on the wall. You know, it was a cool thing, but when it came down to the spiritual side of it, it got serious. And God showed me, he is moving, and there are many who are moving toward him, and at the same time, there are others in the same family who are moving away from him. Isn't that amazing? Two things can be true at the same time. And so with that said, I don't believe things just happen randomly. I believe they they happen for all of these purposes. So I got my spirit rejuvenated by just being there and seeing that, and it reminded me of of our ministry, of our guys, and what God is doing here. And then I I got to listen to the message and, you know, hear about what was going on, and, and man, I got encouraged. And then I opened up God's Word. I've been, for two weeks, I've been reading the same passage over and over and over and over and over again, to get clarity on the direction for, the, for today's message. And so what I'm saying is this. We're in a series on power in the book of Acts. It's no accident that we're on this right now in the history and life of our church while God is doing a special thing. We read a few weeks ago about the prophet Joel who said, you know, that your, your young men and your young women will, you know, will, will get serious about God and they'll have visions and You know, and they'll live for God, and and the Holy Spirit will be in them. And that was being fulfilled right there on the spot, and it's still being fulfilled today. Just look at what happened here this morning. Brother Ray and I have been having, man, we've been walking down memory lane a little bit today, he and I, all day since he got here this morning. And, uh, you know, a lot of you younger families don't realize, Ray, you stand up over there. He's just one of them, Ray. Um, where is Janie? Janie, you're back there. So, yeah, go ahead and stand, Miss Janie. I, I'll just point them out, and for fear that I may miss somebody else, I know there, there are other people who work, but, you know, you, you worked on Wednesday night with the kids for a long, long time, right, in Awana and all of that, you know? I mean, Jeremiah and Kevlin did the same thing for years. Uh, okay, you can sit down. Janie, you worked Children's Church for a long, long time. We finally gave you a break right? She, she's coming to church now, and she's like, oh, I didn't realize my pastor had a beard now. You know, it's been so long since I've seen him. But anyway, no, you can sit down. These are two people here that for years have poured in the kids, along with a bunch of others, okay? But Ray and I were talking, and, uh, you know, we're talking about some of these young men who are leading in our church now. And it got him emotional seeing this, that The next generation has taken the mantle of leadership 
You know Jacob and Kaylee live in Lake City? Do you know that? Now they both work in this area, but they stay here. Some of the last ones to leave every Wednesday night, and then they drive home to Lake City. I would sell my house or find me another church if I were them, but I don't want them to do either. <laughs> and God is at work in, in us right now. I, I hope you see that. I hope you know that this is a special time to be alive. The church is not dead. God's not dead. He's surely alive. He's moving in our lives. He's changing young people. I had a young person, I won't mention that person's name, text me yesterday, wanted to know what time church started today. That's awesome. It's just so encouraging and so wonderful. So with that, I want us to dive into the book of Acts here, chapter 2. Stand with me, if you will. We're going to read. We're going to talk about Peter preaching the greatest message that's ever been preached. The greatest message is on the day of Pentecost. And man, when you, you, you realize Peter was a fisherman, right? He wasn't a theologian. And he lays out four proofs of the resurrection. Something that, that may be a scribe or a Pharisee or a Sadducee would know or someone like that in the religious hierarchy. Not an everyday fisherman. But because Peter loved Jesus, he was saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. He was able to do things that he otherwise could not do in his own strength. And in this message, in beginning, beginning in verse 22 of Acts chapter 2, it says, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God, remember we talked about that two weeks ago, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken, therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. So fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. So he's quoting David in the 16th Psalm. And he's saying, this is what David said, but David's not talking about this about himself because his bones are still here. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. That he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore... Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for the word. Thank you for your truth. There's a lot here. I want to make it as simple as I can. Help us apply it to our lives and see that he lives. He's alive. He's working. He's moving. And he's not finished with us yet. I prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now remember, this is the day of Pentecost. This is the day that 
the church came into being. This is the day that the Holy Spirit, the promise of Jesus that the Holy Spirit would come, the Comforter would, would come. And they experienced this marvelous experience, you know, um, of what happened. And 120 of them were in a room, and the Holy Spirit came upon them like tongues of fire. And they began to speak in other languages. And it was a sign to unbelievers that this was truly of God. And all of a sudden, they received power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. And others from around started hearing what was going on in that room, in that house, and a crowd gathered. And so Peter got up and he started to speak to them. And we dealt with some of that here a couple of weeks ago. But then we pick it up here. And if you look at this passage, you see four proofs that he gives of the resurrection. This entire passage is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's trying to explain to the Israelites who are, who are experiencing this and seeing this, and he's saying to them, look, you're seeing all these people, you're seeing them speak in a language that they don't even know. You're seeing boldness upon them. This isn't an accident. Huh. The prophet Joel said this, and you're seeing it this very day. The Holy Spirit isn't living anymore in a place called the Holy of Holies. The veil was torn from top to bottom to represent that, that God isn't separated from man by, you know, in a building or in a room. And it's not just some high priest that can go and communicate with God. That now the Holy Spirit is given to all who believe, to anyone who comes to him, Jew, Gentile, or what have you. And that's what he's preaching. And in so doing, he wanted to remind them that this Jesus not only died, but he is alive today. And he lays out the proofs for it. The first proof we see of the resurrection here that I want you to see is, number one, the person of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus himself is the first proof of the resurrection. He says here in verse 22, as we read just a moment ago, and he says, look, you see, you see for yourselves, you know this, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. God had a plan. And you with with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. And again, this is what we focused on two weeks ago. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it is impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Jesus, y'all can put up point number one, y'all, if you can. There you go. Jesus is the proof he himself the person of Jesus Christ is the proof of the resurrection. The historical Jesus lived. And all of these witnesses and all of these people saw him and he, he came back to life. There are no bones. I mean, he's talking about David and saying, hey, he, you can go to his tomb. You know, it's amazing. I don't know if you've ever spent time walking through the cemetery across the street. It's not ours. The church doesn't own it. It's Jonesville Community Cemetery. But um, you can go peacefully walk over there and look at some of those tombs, man. There's some Civil War graves there. I've been here long enough, 27 years, that we've buried quite a few people across the street. When you go back to when I go back to Louisiana, you know, we because of the water table and all that, you can't you can't bury people six feet under; they'll float. So you put them in 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 tombs, like the Bible was talking about, in sepulchers, in mausoleums, above the ground, or just slightly in the ground, but still partly above the ground. And when we go. Over there, I don't see it in a whole lot of places, but over there, everybody's got a picture. And it's got this little oval thing, and you can open it. It's got like a metal casing with a glass, and then behind it is a picture of that person. And, and you see who they are. You see the day they were born, the day they died. And then a lot of times you'll see a husband and a wife, and, and then you open that thing, and you can see the picture. And as kids, we used to go when we used to go and 
whitewash the tombs with my grandpa. And we would go and run throughout the cemetery and we'd look at all the pictures to see if they changed. You know. And I remember one of my buddies saying, I can't wait till my picture's on there. And I went, I can. <laughs> right? In other words, a tomb. We know that the remains of a loved one is there or it's in the ground. But you can't go to a, a tomb to look for the bones and the remains of Jesus. You can go to what many believe to be the historical tomb in Jerusalem. The stone is rolled away. He's not in there. He's gone. He himself is the proof of the resurrection. The very fact that he said he would rise and that he did. The second proof of the resurrection is the prophecy of David. The prophecy of David, he says here, this is a, uh, a quotation from the 16th Psalm, verses 8 through 11. I'm not going to read it all because it's right there. We read it once here before, and then verses 25 through 30 talk about this particular passage. It's a messianic prophecy. It's a prophecy about the Messiah who would come, and it, 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 it makes reference to the fact that he would overcome the the grave. He says here in verse 27, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. So not only do we have the person of Jesus Christ himself that proves that Jesus is alive, but we have a prophecy of David from the Old Testament talking about the Messiah, the, the, the one who would come. Uh, you know what's crazy? It's, it's kind of difficult to wrap their head around all of this, but many Jews, though they knew all of that, they, they couldn't put it together. They couldn't wrap their head around the fact that their Messiah would be a suffering servant and that he would have to die. They just couldn't quite see it. They went right past that and went to the fact that, oh, he's the con coming conquering king, and they missed this part of it. And that's why Judaism today doesn't accept Jesus as the Messiah, because they don't believe he, that he was. But according to Scripture, the Old Testament Scripture talks about the Holy One would not see decay. And David prophesied about that. And here's what's amazing about that, too. And Peter wanted to make sure people didn't confuse what was going on. He said, I'm not talking about David. David was a king, and he had a prophet's ministry, if you will. He was a prophet and a king. And God promised him that through his lineage, through his bloodline, <coughs> excuse me, would come the Messiah. And so David, maybe not fully understanding what it all meant, prophesied about what would take place here. So here we see the prophecy of David and everything that's, that, that, that happened and that God promised that he would have a descendant on the throne. So, see Jesus? Now we see this Old Testament prophecy about him, but here's the third thing in this sermon that is being preached right here to the Israelites that is pointed out. <laughs> you want to know? You see it. The proof of the resurrection, the witness of believers. Not just the eyewitness of believers, but the life witness of believers. You follow me? Not just the fact that, oh, I saw him. Because somebody could say, well, <laughs> you, saw, <laughs> you think you saw him. You saw this, you saw that. You saw a goat. You didn't see him. But the concept here, he says here in verses 31 and 32, Seeing what was to come, he, meaning David, spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God raised, has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. I saw the empty tomb, Peter's saying. I saw him walking on the beach. 
I ate with him. And he said, Peter, feed my sheep. He met with us and said, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then we saw him go up in the clouds. Man, we are witnesses of everything, eyewitness-wise. But Peter is also reminding everybody that they are witnesses in life experience. In other words, Jesus changed their life. Peter was a fisherman now, and he was scared at one point. Now he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he is preaching the greatest sermon ever preached on the birthday of the church. God used Peter in a mighty way, and you're going to see next week when thousands receive Christ as their Savior that day. That's the witness. The witness of believers. Here we are thousands of years later, several thousand years, 2,000 plus years later. And we're still gathering to worship the risen Savior. We still celebrate. We sang songs this morning about His resurrection. We're still talking about Jesus working in our hearts and living in us. We are the witnesses of his resurrection. <clears throat> so, Pastor, man, I don't know if I got, I got some people I work with, and boy, they're skeptics, and I just don't know how to convince them. It's not up to you to convince them. And here's the other thing, too. You don't have to go into some deep, deep theological dive where you, you probably don't, won't know what you're talking about that much. But, but revert back to this and say this, you know, sir, ma'am, listen, I, I don't know. I don't know, what you, I don't know what to tell you, but all I can tell you is this. I know what he's done for me. I know that he's alive because he lives within my heart. I know that he is real because he changed me. I was a bitter and selfish and angry person. And now I'm saved and changed and sanctified and set apart for God's holy use. Oh, I still struggle too, and I still sin from time to time, but there's a difference. My want to within me has changed. No one can do that. My mama and daddy couldn't do it. My mama with a switch couldn't make me change my heart. My mama doing a helicopter whooping couldn't change my heart. You know what a helicopter whooping is, right? Not a helicopter parent. I'm talking about a helicopter whooping. And that is when she has a paddle or a belt or a switch and she's going sounds just like a helicopter and you turn and just like a rotor and all of that. And the whole time I'm yelling, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. Mama couldn't change my heart. I met a girl at church. She got me interested in her, and she told me about Jesus, but she couldn't change my heart. It's not until I gave my life to Jesus Christ that my life was changed, and it wasn't until that resurrection power that overcame decay, that overcame death, hell, and the grave came into my life that I could change. You know, one of the things, I think one of the biggest evidences of your salvation, obviously, is to change life. But listen to me. It, it, you, can, you can check yourself on this. How do you handle, as a Christian, when people wrong you? How do you handle that? I'm not saying you have to be a machine. Because we're, we have emotion. And it hurts sometimes. And it causes us to be angry. I'm not talking about maybe immediate response to something in your mind or in your heart. And you, you know, we all can have those moments. But I'm talking about settle down for a moment. And can you cancel that debt? Can you forgive that person? Are you willing to let it go? See, that's a that's that's an evidence. That's one of the evidences that. There's been a change that happened within you. And you are a witness. 
of the miraculous, changing, resurrecting power of Jesus in you. That's what Peter was telling them. He says, man, these people here, what you're seeing is of God. What you're seeing was, was prophesied about Joel. What you're seeing David talked about. And Christ rose from the dead, and we are witnesses of it. We experienced it. We saw him. We touched him after he rose from the dead. We ate with him. We are witnesses. That's the proof of the resurrection. Finally, listen. The fourth thing. I get five, four main points and then one last thing I want to give you in, in closing. But the fourth thing is this. The proof of the resurrection is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Jesus predicted and promised that he would do this. Look at what John 14, 26 says about what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. He says here, but the advocate. You know, when I first got saved, I'm from a Cajun culture. We speak French down there and in South Louisiana. And I remember when I first read that, I said, look, there's a French word, avocat. Avocat, an advocate, a lawyer, a defender. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Jesus predicted and promised the Holy Spirit. And then if you'll look with me in John 15, 26 and 27. And when the Advocate comes, he says, whom I will send to you from the Father. He's telling him this again. The Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. So here Peter is preaching and testifying under the leadership of the Holy Spirit about the resurrection of Jesus. And you also must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit. The fact that these so-called insignificant people in the world they weren't the religious rulers. And when I say rulers, I mean rulers. When Peter preached and he said, evil men, meaning the Roman government and Pontius Pilate and his hatchet men literally did the deed and put him to death, but you crucified him. And he's talking to the religious leaders, and they're religious leaders, Israelites in that crowd that Peter was preaching to. And the very People that had the power to have Jesus executed, Peter is now standing before them and preaching the truth straight to them and hitting them right between the eyes and in the heart, saying, you did this. That's the evidence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit in Peter's life and the pouring of the Holy Spirit on these people is an evidence of the resurrection that Jesus promised that after he left and after he rose from the dead and after he ascended, he would send the Holy Spirit. He will lead you into all truth. He will remind you of what I've said. <laughs> and here's Peter just giving it all out just like Jesus taught. And so because of all of this, the last thing I want you to see is this, therefore, he is the promised Messiah. Look at verse 36. Therefore, he says. Always ask yourself when you see that word, coach. What is the therefore, therefore? It's a, it's a good reminder to say, oh, because he said all of that, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, again, whom you crucified, both Lord and and Messiah. Now, next week we're going to preach on the rest of it. Verse 37, just give you a little glimpse. You've read this many times, but when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? He says, therefore, because of all of this, because he is the promised Messiah, I mean, because he is the one who defeated death, hell, and the grave, the proofs are there. Jesus' very life and resurrection. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit. The witnesses. 
the prophecy in the Old Testament of David and the fact that he comes directly from the line of David, both through Mary and through Joseph. This is the one. This is the one the Old Testament talked about. This is the one. God has made him both Lord and Messiah. He is our Messiah, people. That's what he's saying to them. And the reason I wanted to spend some time kind of dissecting this message is because it's important. It's the first message, New Testament message ever preached, you know, New Covenant message ever preached after the giving of the Holy Spirit. And here it is. How does all that apply to me today? Well, <clears throat> you can choose to live your life your way. Doing it your way. And you get what your way gives you. Which is whatever it gives you. You might be able to get the American dream and make lots of money and build you a nice house and own lots of land and buy nice toys and maybe even be a little powerful and be involved in politics and influence people and push your money around and, and so forth and so on. But one day there's a day coming for you. It's an appointment, the Bible says. Appointed for men to die once and after this, the judgment. And one day you end up like the former, who formed and planted his fields, and he had such a bumper crop. He had so much. He didn't have room to keep it all. And so rather than giving maybe a 10% portion of his field to the poor, which was customary in those days, he didn't. He didn't give anything to the poor. He built other barns. So he could put all of his bounty in. And one night he was just sitting there. Maybe he was sitting by the fire overlooking these vast laborants of, 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 of borns that he built. Full of grain. Full of the toil of his life. He was wealthy. He said, I have need of nothing. I've got everything that I need sitting right there, sipping on whatever he was sipping, drinking with his legs up and just saying, man, I've got it made. And then God said to him, you fool, your soul will be required of you this night. And the man died that night. And then the Bible says, a man's life does not consist of the things that he acquires or that he has. That's what I spoke to those men about there in Georgia. There's something more to life than all of those things. It's called Jesus. I'm not trying to pour on this guy. Nobody would want their personal life to be all over the public, but it is. But you know, the greatest uh, football player to ever play, I mean, sad, really sad what just happened. But he and his wife announced publicly that they're getting a divorce, or they've already divorced. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I didn't read it. I just saw the headline. The rumors were flying around. Oh, we don't, Brady didn't have a ring on. Oh, she didn't have a ring. And this and that. And they have three children together. You know, th these are people. I don't care how wealthy and how famous they are. They got everything that this world has promised for them. Riches and fame and fortune. Celebrity. But what's missing there? I don't know. I don't know what their total spiritual makeup is. I know some things that Brady has said about spirituality, and, and it's kind of, he's all over the place. What does it profit a man for him to gain the whole world but lose his own soul? So you can choose to go that way, or you can choose to believe the record of the Word of God, that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Lord of glory. He made you and created you, and He has a plan for your life. He has dibs on what He wants for you in your life and how He wants to use you. 
So does that mean I've got to be a preacher? No, only those whom he called. Because how would the rest of the world be reached, right? Most of you come across more lost people in a day than I come across in a given week. So he wants to use you right where you are. But what he wants is he wants you to give your heart and life to him and let the resurrection of, power, uh, resurrection of Christ and his power be placed within you. And your life will change, not only here on this earth, but for all of eternity. If he's Lord and Messiah, then I I need to be, like, seriously paying attention to what he requires, what he wants. And what he wants from you and me, he wants us to obey the gospel. He's already done it for us. He's already given his life. He already defeated death, hell, and the grave. Actually, he wants to give you a gift, a beautiful gift. I love gifts, don't you? Now, I'm not, don't, don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I endorse online shopping and Amazon and all of that. I know we, I'm waiting for Walker over there to go, out, go after me on that, you know, but in a good way. And I, I know where he's coming from, eBay and a whole bunch. I'm not, but you know what? When you do order something online, you buy yourself a gift, don't you? I like it. And somebody comes and delivers it to your door. And they ring your doorbell. And they say, your gift has arrived. Yeah. And I got one of them ring cameras. And no matter where I'm at, I see my gift. And Penny goes, I didn't order anything. She was saying that of herself. And she goes, did you order something? And I went, maybe. Maybe. Is it something useful? Oh, yeah. It's dough urine. Mm-hmm. Best in the world. It's some hunting gear. I like gifts. But the problem is, you can say that all you want, and then you go online and you open up your bank account and you realize that the company you bought that from took some money from you. It wasn't free. But the gift of salvation, you don't have to earn it, and you don't pay for it. Jesus paid it all. And it's a free gift. It's the greatest gift you could ever have. All because of the resurrection of Jesus. Would you stand with me, everybody?